we are here. We've made it. People are trickling in from the other part. While they do that, we will get Ariana Christione joining us uh, to give a workshop on what it's like to not only play for Paris Saint Germain in the goal, but to also work in their office. Ariana, have you? We know you filled in uh, when we had something drop out, so we're stoked you could make that accommodation. Also, what a season! What a journey! It's so fun to be able to connect with players directly in it as we've been talking to most women that are off the field that are behind the scenes in management talking about mentorship the importance of staying strong the importance of confidence how you tackle imposter syndrome the list is endless we'll we'll let a few more folks trickle in and while they do if you're just joining us tell us where you're joining us from in the chat any questions you'll have for ariana put that in the q a tab on your chat and she will do her best to answer those at the end. Otherwise, we then have a breakout segment following this and we'll get to hang out with some rad folks and I will give you all some more insight into that after. But Ariana, how are you? I'm awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad I could help and jump in. I'm a little, not necessarily nervous, but I, it's not very much time and my story is kind of crazy. So I don't know what have, what have I done so far or where can I add value to this? Imposter syndrome is a little difficult. I still feel like I have some imposter syndrome, but um. Yeah. And that's, that's value, a huge value add right there. You're playing at the highest level. You're also spreading yourself beyond just the field. So that, that says it all. I think reminding folks that, yeah, you can, you're going to have bad days, but you have to keep going. Tell us your story. People are really excited to hear from you. Don't worry about, we'll, we'll figure out the time. We, we okay. always manage to make it work, but I'll let you dive right in. Cool. Well, first off, well, thank you, Courtney. Thanks for doing this, women in soccer. Um, Sandra, I'm actually from Diamond Bar, so not so far from Riverside. Definitely went out there. I do have to throw this out there to you, all of you guys. It's super weird. I'm just staring at myself, and that's not a very comfortable situation for most people, let alone most women, but hopefully this will be good. So as Rachel was saying, my name is Ariana Crisioni. I'm a professional football player, soccer player, for Paris Saint-Germain here in Paris. I'm currently in Paris. And I grew up in Southern California, specifically Diamond Bar, California. And here goes my story. So as a young child, I started playing football, but for a very unique reason. Um, my dad always thought he would have sons. He was not so lucky or he was super lucky and he had two daughters and he really wanted us to become ballerinas and dancers and cheerleaders and all of these great stuff. And we were not that, we're still not that, but that's fine. Those women are still completely athletes in total respect. But yeah, so my sister, she was a little chubby as a kid and my mom decided to sign her up for AYSO. A lot of you guys probably know what that is. When I speak about it in Europe, nobody does, but in the States we do. And my dad wasn't too stoked about it, but he definitely came around and really embraced the girl dad. And by my sister's second season, my dad was the head coach. My dad was an American football player, and so he taught us how to catch a ball like an American football. And for years, that's how I did it uh, because of my sister's stature. And don't worry, she doesn't get mad. Well, she does a little annoyed that I tell this story, but my sister's gorgeous, super fit. You'd never know that this is her background story, so don't worry, she's okay with it. Um, she was put in the goal, and because she's my older sister and I've always wanted to be just like her, I wanted to play in the goal too. At the time, my coach did not want me to play goalkeeper because I was tall and skinny and he thought I could run. I hate running. I still hate running to this day. Preseason is the bane of my existence, but somehow I find a way. And so I went in the goal and kind of the rest is history. I went up through the ODP system. Yeah, all my Saturdays are totally occupied. I went through the ODP system in the US. I made my first district team when I was 11 years old. I made the U14, so I progressed really quick not because of my amazing skills or huge attributes, purely because I was completely fearless, did not mind getting kicked in the face, did not mind diving in the dirt, and it allowed for me to grow and to become a better player and allowed coaches to want to work with me and coach me. So I was super lucky in this aspect, and I think that's been a huge part of my whole development as a player and a person. I've never been scared to jump into things and just go headfirst at everything. From my youth, sorry if I'm going really fast, but we'll understand why. From my youth, I ended up uh, in the number one draft class in the, the country at the time, and I made a super easy choice, and I committed to UCLA very early. 
UCLA did not go as planned my freshman year. We made it to the final four, but I made a huge, huge, huge mistake in our game where my coach came on at halftime and told the world, because we were on ESPN Live, that I shot my team in the foot and that basically was all my fault that we lost this game. Um, it was so bad that I made bloopers, top 100, top 10, top five of the whole year on ESPN bloopers. And if you guys catch up with me, I'll explain that story. And so bad, my sister actually went to USC and during the Rose Bowl game that year, the guys in front of her, there was a bad play on the field and the guys in front of her was like, oh, this is not as bad as the UCLA goalkeeper. So it was a really big, big mess up. And it was really hard to get over as an 18 year old little girl. We don't usually think of 18 year olds as little, but I definitely was. And it was kind of traumatic and I didn't want to give up football. I talked to my parents about it and we just decided that I should either stop playing soccer completely at UCLA or I should transfer. And I decided I wasn't going to quit. I would never quit. So I had to transfer. So I ended up talking to my coach. When I talked to my coach, <laughs> she told me it was a good idea. The first thing she said when I said, I'm thinking about transfer, she said, good idea. So that kind of cemented that I should be leaving UCLA. And because UCLA, I'm from Southern California, it was a very easy choice to go there close to my family. My family could come to my games. My family's always been extremely supportive. I decided to go crazy and go all the way across the country. And I signed for Boston College. Went, <laughs> went to Boston College and I was coming in as I was a junior. And I was taking the position of a senior and a lot of the girls didn't really like that and they didn't warm up well to me. And so I'd left UCLA where I was really close to my teammates. I had a lot of really good friends and I went into this new situation where I didn't know anybody. They didn't want me there. Um, it was a completely culture shock. I'm from Southern California. Those of you who are on here, I think we're pretty laid back. You like people because you like them, not because of how much money they make, where their family comes from what color they are, they're either nice and you like them or that you don't and not much other stuff behind it. And at BC, it was very much where you came from and how much money your family has and just not a really great situation. But it really set me up for playing abroad in Europe and understanding that you don't always have to be friends with your teammates or your colleagues or the people around you in order to get the job done. And this was my first real learning experience about this. And from Boston College, I always wanted to play professional soccer. It was my dream from a really young age. And when I graduated, there was no longer a league in the United States. So I figured out how to get myself abroad. And I started also to get my family lineage going to get an Italian passport because I knew it would be easier for a goalkeeper to play in Europe if I had a second citizenship. So I first went to Sweden and then I ended up contacting a bunch of teams in Italy having tryouts and I signed for an Italian team where my team on the field, we had a lot of success. I was lucky to win a lot, a lot of titles, but I was an outcast within the team. And it was a little difficult, but I think because of my experience, uh, it helped me a lot in order to grow as a player and as a person. I was able to find friends outside the field and create um, a system for myself that was really helpful in this situation. From Italy, I ended up moving to Holland um, from Holland, I didn't like the situation, so I ended up coming here in France, and I played for Saint-Étienne. And in Saint-Étienne, the worst possible thing happened to me in the best possible place. I tore my ACL, my MCL, my PCL, and both meniscus in one, uh, one moment, and it put me out of the game for 18 months. So it was another moment to, to focus on what I wanted, and what I wanted was to come back and play football again. And it was a very long struggle, but it was totally worth it. I was also lucky that in this time in France, they have a center that they send professional athletes to and you live there and there's doctors and nurses, but there's also physical therapists. And so you have this system where I didn't have to cook. All my food was ready for me. All I had to do was go into the gym and do the exercises and then I'd go upstairs to my room. So it was amazing. And honestly, I don't think I would be playing today if I didn't have that opportunity. Uh, I did come back from this injury. We weren't sure that I would, and the doctors were continuously trying to make sure that I was realistic and that just walking or running again was a huge step forward and that playing again at a high level probably wasn't going to happen. 
so I ended up going to Scandinavia in order to come back and I played first in Norway. That went really well. And uh, so I transferred during the middle of that season to Sweden, which is a better league. That went well again. Um, and so I knew that I could play again. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I can read the chat while you guys are talking. It's encouraging. Again, super weird just staring at myself. Um, so from Scandinavia, the way the league works in Scandinavia is it goes through the summer and then it goes halfway into the fall. But the transfer window isn't until December, January. So you have this weird off time. And I went back to the United States. But my then boyfriend, now fiance, was here in France. And so we decided that it would be better if I moved to Europe and lived with him and trained with him. Then staying in the United States would be easier for me to find a team. Uh, in that period, unfortunately, I was not able to find a team. But he was. He works in football, but on the medical side. And so he ended up finding a team in the north west of France and so I ended up coming with him and discussing where I should go in my career and what was happening and by now I was already in my 30s. I decided I didn't want to go back to Scandinavia. I loved playing the game but I didn't know what my objective was anymore and where I was going so I ended up signing for a D2 team closer to him so we could stay together and I absolutely hated it. For me I want to be playing at a really high level or just playing random games on the weekends with friends. But the middle part just doesn't really work for me. And I wasn't happy. And I've always told myself that if I wasn't happy playing football, I would stop. Or if I got too old, which is more where I am now. And so um, I started looking at jobs and what I could do with my degree. And I figured out that here in France, you always need a master's degree for whatever reason. So I decided I would go back to school. And I actually found a program in football business based in Switzerland that would allow me to go to school online but the classes were live on Zoom, and at the moment, this was two, three years ago, this is a weird concept. It's not like today where after COVID, we all do a lot of stuff like we're doing now. Um, so I was hesitant to do the program, but I'm so glad I did. It allowed me to finish my season, but to start a new education and get more into the business side of football. So I finished my season, started my degree, and then I got into the fall, and I needed to do an internship for my degree. And I ended up getting an internship at Benfica in Lisbon. So I moved to Lisbon. I was just working in marketing. <laughs> Never told that to play. Um, I was working in marketing for um, SL Benfica. And I loved it. And it was actually the year that they'd started their women's team. So I thought about going out for the women's team. And my fiance was like, babe, come on. Like, I'm not sure your knee can do it. Aren't we kind of over this football thing? Like, start your career off the field. And my head is always in the clouds. Yes, it was the FBA. If you guys want to know more about the FBA, I'll tell you guys after. Um, so, and he brings me down to reality. So it's, it's actually a good thing. In the, um, so I finished my internship and then January, February, I had to move to Switzerland in order to finish my degree. I finished my degree and then I found myself in this really weird stage of, okay, what do I do now? And I had been, no, I won't tell you who the coach was. And so uh, at the time, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, the part of France that we live in, it's a really cute city, but there's not a huge amount of opportunities within sports. And so I did a lot of networking, a lot of just talk, calling different people in the industry throughout the world and trying to learn more. And I got really lucky because one of my professors, who's also a good friend now and a mentor, invited me to head the, be a project manager for the first ever women's freestyle football tournament right before Women's Champions League in 2019. So I worked on this project. I went there. It was amazing. And it was the first time in that year that I really, really missed playing. These women were just spectacular and they made me miss the game. And ironically enough, during that Women's Champions League, then <laughs> after, I called my sister and I told her I'd play in Champions League again. I didn't know how or when, but it was going to happen. And fate would have it. The next day I found myself in a first class ticket. I don't know how I had a first class ticket, but God was definitely smiling on me. And I sat next to the sporting director of Paris Saint-Germain. And by the time we landed and the flight ended, I had talked myself into two contracts. One, playing on the women's team. And two, working in the marketing department, heading up the women's sponsorship team, trying to find standalone sponsors for here in Paris. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's what I'm doing now. I, a player on the women's team, I'm a full-time player, so that's 100%. And then I work all the other hours trying to build the sponsorship team and doing other women's uh, development projects 
around my teammates and, and other stuff. I find it super beneficial that I really know women's football and I especially know my teammates and I know what happens in our locker room that allows me to connect our team to different sponsors and brands and create authentic activations that the players really care about and the brands are going to see and it comes out live and <laughs> um, all the things we do. So that's where I currently am. This is kind of a Reader's Digest, very quick version of my story. My story is not ending, but a chapter of my life will end in three weeks, less than I, I've, I've calculated. There's less than nine practices I have left on the football field as a player. I will be retiring. Uh, June 3rd is our last game, and it will be my last game officially. I'm 100% retiring this year, and I will be moving on to fully work in women's football. Unfortunately, the club, because of circumstances in, in the world right now, they're not able to create a full position for the women's side. But I will be living here in France and I will be starting to work on women's football development and how that relates to the structures of teams from professionalization to sustainability to sponsorships. Um, there's a whole lot that goes into that and we just don't have that much time for me to explain all of this. But that's my objective. Um, love how you guys are chatting so much in the chat. That's my very quick story. We are currently number one in the league. And if we can hold on to this for three more games, we will make history at Paris Saint-Germain. The women's team has never won the league. So it's a very exciting moment for us. I hope you guys all watch our games, these last three games, because it's going to be a wild ride to the finish. And yeah, exactly. Fire away. Who has questions about which way what? There was already one question. You can watch on Ada Football. Exactly. Um, there was one question. Can you explain how a keeper sets up a wall? Yeah, so a wall really depends on where you are on the field and also as a goalkeeper, how comfortable you are coming out on aerial balls or through balls. And so depending where on the field, you'll call your players. You'll usually have set that up with your coaches and your players beforehand, which player kind of controls the wall and looks at you and you call the number of players you need. It usually is on depending which side of the field. You would take a midfielder and a winger or players that don't mind being hit. <laughs> how is compensation? Um, and that's kind of how you set up a wall. Whether you put one, two, three, four, five players really depends on your team, the players that go in the wall, and the goalkeeper's comfort level of who's kicking and how. So it's kind of a little complicated and convoluted question, but I hope that kind of answered it. Okay, Andrea Bitten, how is compensation compared to the men's game in the back office? The back office in women in football in general is not amazing. I'm going to be totally honest with you, but the salaries are the same. If you uh, work in media for the women's team or the men's team, you probably make the same price if you're starting off. Like it's any business going into it. Everybody kind of starts at the same level. It would be irrelevant if you were working for the men or women's team. The difference come in more on the, um, the technical team. Clearly the coaches don't make as much and things like that. But somebody working in communications for the women's team or the men's team probably has a base salary that's the same. Strategy, Dr. Melanie Driver, you want strategy on building the wall. Um, Melanie, can you kind of go into detail? What do you mean by strategy? Honestly, I think walls depend on the personal goalkeeper if they're comfortable. And also too, on the other side, who's shooting? Is this a player that shoots or is this a player that's gonna put in a ball that's across so you want more people marking? It also depends on the coaching staff, how they want to be defending this and the defenders in the wall and the defenders on the field if they're good at headers. Maybe you put less in the wall, hoping that they'll knock it over. Or actually, if you put less in the wall, they'd probably shoot. But um, OK, Becky, can you talk about the FBA experience? Useful or suggest other programs? Um, I loved the FBA. Uh, I think they're very extensive programs, I'm not going to lie. But for women out there, they usually have a scholarship for women. Strongly recommend paying attention to that. I personally, I'd been looking at programs for a long time. And I looked at the U8 program, or the FIFA, no, the FIFA program. But I didn't like the FIFA program because when I was looking at it, one, you had to pay all of it up front and it was a lot of money. And two, the, the FIFA program, you have to be on campus the whole time. And I would not have been able to, one, finish football. And for most of my colleagues, they were able to work during parts of our schooling. And that was really helpful to pay for school. Where the FIFA program, it's comparable in price, but you have to get, go there the whole time. So you have to have all that money up front. Ah, okay. Thanks, Melanie. Um, exactly. Um, so I really enjoyed the FBA. I like our field trips, but for me, 
the FBA is a lot about networking. And honestly, in my opinion, football in sports is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot about your network. Um, if you know people and they trust you and your abilities, they're more likely to put you up for positions. And because most people want to work in sport, they get a lot of resumes. Whereas if you know someone or someone can pass your resume to the right person, it's really, really helpful. No worries, Everett, it's all good. Everett, what do you wanna know about the FIFA master? Oh, there's more questions, thanks. Well, um, caveat, I don't, okay, I know that Casey Stoney left and I know that she's been told other options. I don't know why exactly she left per se. My the, the few articles I've read about it is also because uh, I believe Manchester United has finished fourth all year that she's been coaching. And so she wanted to do more. When will women's soccer be treated equally? I think this is a really loaded question. What do you mean by equally? Because I'm going to be totally honest with you guys. We can't get paid the same amount of money. It's really controversial to say that, but I don't mind saying it. Women football players cannot be paid the same amount of money in today's economics. We do not have the ticket sales. We do not have the jersey sales. We do not have the sponsorship money. For us to be paid the same amount of the men's team would be absolutely crazy from an economic and sustainable standpoint. Now, should there be more investment in those things, in the, the media rights, in the broadcasting, in the amount that the teams are actually advertising their women's team, in the structure of the club, making sure that you have somebody on the sponsorship team that's just devoted to the women's team, making sure you have somebody in the communications team that's just devoted to the women's team. Absolutely. But I really don't like this word equal. It's, it doesn't work from a financial standpoint. It, it just doesn't work. Um, so how do we increase the commercial side of the women's game? For me, the way we start to increase the commercial side of the women's game is we actually start using the word investment. A lot of clubs throw around the word investment. For me, it's not investing. If you just put money in women's football and then the money's spent, that's not an investment. That's just putting money somewhere. Investing means you have a three-year plan, a five-year plan. You know where that money's going and you know why. And you're bringing in people, as I said, to work on the commercial side. And they understand the women's game. They understand the women players. And they're trying to build on that in order to bring in those commercial sponsors in order to make activations that make sense and you're not just throwing a female into a commercial to, to check a box. Uh, for me, these are the ways that we're actually gonna build it. We also need to build a better product. For example, here in France, you have Paris Saint-Germain, you have Lyon and you have Bordeaux every, and Montpellier. Everybody else is so far below that if we play in the games, we beat them by 14 points. That's not an exciting product. We need every game to be as exciting as when we play Lyon. When we play Lyon, we can get 60,000 people into the stadium. When we play Rons, if you could get 5,000, it would be a miracle. So these are the parts I think that we really have to start building women's football. Malik, what have you learned from traveling around the world, pursuing your passion, culturally, professionally? Person? Wow, I think we could be here for another hour, but I've definitely started, especially when I start to learn the language, I think you can understand more about people and why they believe things the way they do. It comes out in their language. Um, it's opened me up to try to step back and listen more and not always assume things. I think growing up in the States, I definitely had preconceived ideas of what certain cultures were like, good and bad. And they're not always that way by any means. And I think it just helps me to have a global view of everybody. I have very strong opinions, but I really think it's important to hear other people's reasons for why they do something or how they do something and then make my own decision. Um, and I try not to judge people, even if I don't agree with something they do, because it's their choice. Um, a question from our earlier management panel that went unanswered. Any feedback here? With the pandemic and social media being game-changing for women's sports, less event companies, and more media companies? <laughs> I mean, I think for me personally, especially here in Europe, the 2019 Women's World Cup, everybody thought that women's football was on this huge trajectory, like on a slant like this. I think we have a positive trajectory, but it's much more like, like this. And I think the pandemic showed us that it's not like this. It's actually like this, which is a good thing. Cause I think if we would have gone 10 years really thinking it was like this, we would have been smacked in the face. And now we know that we still have a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do. Uh, no, I think events are still really important. I think we need to get people to the stadiums and we need to get people paying attention. Um, if we get games on TV, that's awesome. But if nobody wants to watch, that doesn't really help either. So I think it's a mixture of both. 
yeah, I think equitable is the word equitable a better fit than equal? I think equitable is too, but I don't I don't like putting things in such a box. I think we need to women's football is the same game. We have 11 players, we have a ball, but it's it's not the same. We're over You have to look at the history of women's football. We were stopped in most countries. It was illegal for women to play football after 19 33, I think, like the Dick Kerr ladies, everybody go look them up. Um, women's football in most of Europe, the United States, it was never officially banned, but women's football is completely banned for almost 50 years. Women were not legally allowed to play football. And this has put us in a huge deficit compared to the men's game. If you go back to like games from the 40s of men, they're not that exciting and it's not that great of football, but they've had years and years and years to develop. And many leagues have had different, like, structures and they've taken actually a lot of structures from the american uh sports and that's how they've built them up so you have to look at it historically and i think women's football is getting there we just can't expect it to happen overnight advice for younger u.s players interested in pursuing european opportunities uh play hard (laughs) continue your dream i strongly recommend getting an education i think an education is super 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 important And in the United States, we're extremely lucky to play university soccer, get an education and play at a high level. So I recommend getting that education and then getting an agent or just calling teams and getting tryouts to come over here to play because we need more women in the business side of the game and not just football. We need it in basketball, NFL, MLB, women's side and men's side. We need more people at the table, more women being decision makers who really understand what's happening and are qualified to be in those roles. I do think that's really important. I don't want women in there just to have a token woman. I think that's the worst idea ever. Um, But I think this is super important. So I'm a big advocate of education. I want women to stay in the game. If you weren't the top player, who cares? If you go to school, almost every degree that you get can like cross over into the sports, whether it's medicine, law, media, marketing, HR, uh, you take it, you name it, and there's a position in the normal world that goes into the sports world. And so I just really want to convince women to apply for the jobs. Our biggest problem is that we don't apply. I'm currently in a FIFA program. I'm in a, um, an executive program, which means you have to be currently in a club and you, you're supposed to be in an executive position. Don't tell them, but I'm technically not an executive position, but I'm the only woman in our course. There's 30 men and me. And it's because I applied, like just not that many women applied. And so I just go out there and apply, talk to people, get experience. I think those are super important. I see you, Rachel. So there's one more question for me to answer it, or do you want us to jump out? We can hold it for now. We're going to hold it because there are some folks that will be hanging out on the floor. We don't want to keep them waiting for too long as they're trickling in now. Ariana, thank you so much. This is so exciting to hear directly from someone so engaged. You also got lots of fun buzzing feedback from your your strong stance on equally, you know, using the words equal, using the words equitable, what does that mean from a U.S. and a national team perspective, right? When we look at ticket sales, we say, hey, well, there's some disparity here when we're looking at our U.S. men's national team. But we could talk about this for hours. Again, like I said, I'm here to keep us on time. Uh, We will have to have you back because we want to unpack more around that as an organization that's so fierce around equity and what that means versus equal and why we think it is a very important word and concept to keep women going. Like you said, investment in the game, put yourself out there, apply, make sure you get seen. Don't give up the resilience. Courtney pointed it out. Oh my gosh, you never stop. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for jumping in. All right, folks, now it's time to break out. You have a 15 minutes, go connect. You have Paige Monahan at the table, Lisa Reisman's out there. You got Tiffany Frazier still sticking around on the mentorship table. If Ariana's around, find her on the floor and there are plenty more folks to be found. We are excited. Paige, thanks so much for hopping up. We are gonna point you to the professional playing table once we close out, find her on floor two. Thanks again, everyone. Bye everyone, thank you. We are about to kick off the breaking into media and journalism in 2021. Oh, do we probably have plenty of questions for these folks. Horizon Starwood, founder of what is called the Horizon um, United FC, an aspiring football journalist. Connect with her. She has a great podcast. Get to know more about Horizon. You will hear, but follow her journey. And then she will welcome on stage Meg Linehan, as we've all met last 
week at Brandy's Corner, if you were there with us, one of the only, uh, I, wait, I won't give it away. I'll let Horizon, Horizon say that, but she is a, a full-time writer at The Athletic, as well as a podcast, podcast host. And then we also have uh, Rachel Kwan joining us from Just Women's Sports, giving us that perspective of what it's like to be in op- the operations side of a media house, specifically one that is you know, pushing the boundaries in the media sector with focusing on women's sports specifically. Paige, we see your shout out. Thanks for joining us. It was so fun. Horizon, if you are ready, please jump up on stage uh, by sharing your camera and your microphone. And Meg as well, if you are here and ready, go for it. And Rachel, you as well. Hello, everyone. I'm Horizon Starwood, and I am the founder of the online community slash platform, Horizons United Football Club. The overall goal or objective of the platform is to bring visibility to the marginalized voices of the football or soccer community, um, whatever you want to call it. And I'm proud to help moderate uh, this panel. And so I'll let Meg and Rachel introduce themselves. I can start real quick. So I'm Meg. I'm a full-time writer at The Athletic covering women's soccer, only women's soccer, host a podcast for The Athletic as well, uh, full-time, and then a digital show with relevant sports called The Fixture. So basically my life is women's soccer. Hey guys, I'm Rachel. Um, I joined Just Women's Sports three, three weeks ago as their head of operations. Um, Just Women's Sports is a digital first media brand um, 100% dedicated to covering women's sports. Um, we were founded in 2020, and um, many of you might have seen last week that we we had our financing announcement, and we're backed by institutional investors as well as athletes like Kevin Durant, Kelly O'Hara, Sam Mewis, and Elena De La Don. You all have really great and interesting backgrounds, so I think a good place to start is like going back in time, and then like how did you guys get to where you are today? <laughs> Horizon, just as a heads up, like someone who's done this, just pick one of us okay. to start so that way we <laughs> make <laughs> otherwise we'll you, just do the like you, you just okay. Start. Yeah. Wait, um wait. so just I was a person that was converted by the 99 World Cup, right? Like I had played youth soccer and all that kind of stuff, but that was kind of the big flashpoint for me. I interned for the Boston Breakers um in WSA the first year. Like, and this is again before the days of Twitter, right? So I was in the press box writing game updates in HTML live. <laughs> so that way people who couldn't be at the game would just refresh the web page to try to figure out what was happening if they if they weren't able to, you know, when the game was on television watch or anything like that. And then, you know, I went to went to college, went and got like a real person job, right? And then got kind of back into it with the 2011 World Cup and just kind of was like, okay, how do I get back into this? And started taking photos for spots like Equalizer Soccer and then started writing. And then by 2015, I was really freelancing and I got offered my first full-time sports writing job by Howard Megdahl at a now defunct, basically uh, the same general concept of just women's sports, but run by people who did not know what they were doing with it. Um, at least from a company point of view, from an editorial point of view, it was one of the best like groups of talent. And then ended up at NWSL um, for a couple of years doing content, social media, and then running the content team. And then in 2019, when the lifetime and NWSL agreement ended, I got a phone call from George Gracie, who was formerly the managing editor of The Athletic, being like, I never thought I was going to be able to make this call to you, but now I, I think maybe you'd be open to a conversation do you want to cover, do you want to come back to the journalism side? And also, do you want to go to France for 30, 35 days to cover the World Cup, which is a really hard offer to turn down um, to go to France to cover a World Cup. And then, so I've been at The Athletic since April 2019 as basically the only full-time women's soccer only writer in the country at a mainstream sports outlet. Yeah, I mean, um, I grew up playing 
sports growing up and I think eventually focused on soccer. Um, like someone said in the chat, I, I was fortunate to go to Stanford and play there and then um, get drafted to the Chicago Red Stars. So played professionally for th three years as well as playing um, with the Canadian national team. Um, my main focus at Stanford was in marketing and communication. So that was always my background. Um, so before joining Just Women Sports, I was the director of marketing and platform at an early stage venture capital firm focused on enterprise software called Coast Snow Ventures. Um, they're out doing marketing ops um, and specifically working with early stage startups, which kind of leads to my journey here. Um, Haley Rosen is the founder of Just Women Sports. I played with her at Stanford. Um, we've always kept in touch and um, I always wanted to get operating experience and, and go to the startup side. Um, and with just women's sports values and the mission. It really aligns with what I want to do and also the skill set that I have. So um, I made the jump. And so I think my journey into media and journalism isn't the tr traditional route, um, which I think hopefully shows that there's many ways to get in. There's not one single way to do it. Um, I have a question for you, Rachel. Given your background and playing for Stanford, the Canadian women's national team, and playing for the Chicago Red Stars, how have those experiences influenced the current work that you're doing today? Yeah, I think, look, I played all sports growing up. My family, like my siblings, we all played and it was all, um, you know, the same level playing fields. And I think going through Stanford and then going playing professionally, it was, I wanted to, right now for just women's sports, I want to build something that I didn't really see when I was playing professionally. Um, and that's the coverage, the consistency, the getting game on TV and things like that. So for me, that's my experience. And I want to build something that female athletes deserve. Um, and that's why it kind of led to me to just women's sports. And then again, I say my values and my mission align with JWS's mission values. And I think that's important, whatever job you do. So. For you, Meg, especially given the pandemic and the current like working environment, what does a typical day look like for you? Um, that's a great question. It really does vary day by day. I I am finally now traveling for games a little bit again. So I went to Red Bull Arena this past weekend for the Gotham FC game, uh, which fortunately on Saturday was also the only one to actually have a goal scored <laughs> before Portland figured out what they were doing. But yeah, I mean, generally, it's a lot of time sitting behind a laptop, a lot of time on the phone and writing, but also obviously with the podcast, like I do all of the planning for that. So writing scripts, booking people to be on the podcast, um, coming up with questions. Fortunately, we do have, you know, an editor on the other side of it. But from a content point of view, it's entirely me like they know that that's going to be my territory. <laughs> Um, so it really is just kind of balancing multiple stories, the podcast, trying to break news, um, and then also, you know, getting meals into the day, not always my strong suit, I will say, um, I did manage to get lunch and I have my coffee <laughs> now. Um, but yeah, it's just, it is very much, there are really fun parts, right? There, there is going to France for 30, 35 days, right? But that is also hugely a grind for people covering it you do not get days off you're constantly trying to go to to trainings to other games to to find stories that other people aren't telling right so you know in theory i'm going to tokyo for the olympics it's going to be an even tougher kind of turnaround and so there are definitely fun parts of the job like i'm not going to say france wasn't fun i think i got two days off and i spent them going on a quick day trip with my wife when she came out. And then we went to a couple of journalists went to um, Paris or yeah, Paris Disneyland on the other day off, which is not really a day that was restful in any way, but was very fun. Um, but it is like, it is very much a grind and every day is kind of, my day goes sideways probably every single day by 11 AM where I think I'm gonna be working on something and then all of a sudden I'm not anymore, so. Real question I was going to ask, do you think that folks want to get into the field of communications, media, and journalism need a degree in that? But the overall consensus that I get from both of you is that that's not the case whatsoever. But someone did ask in the Q&A, um, Alejandra Martin asked, is there something specific someone should do if they want to break into the communication side of women's soccer? 
So, um, Rachel, do you want to start off with that? Sure. I think um, there's a couple things here. Like any career, I think you have to decide what you want to learn and accomplish. And I think specifically for getting into media and journalism, it's do you want to be at a startup? Do you want to be at a more established company? Do you want to be like Meg was? She was in the league. She worked for the league. So being a little bit more specific there. Um, and then also talking, like, think about your role as well. So there are so many roles, as you see here, is head of operations. Do you want to be a broadcaster? Do you want to be a writer? Do you want to be social media manager? There's so many roles there. So I think first kind of drilling it down on what you want to do, what you want to learn. And then I would say just get experience where you can to build that skill set and portfolio. So I'm sure Meg has more here to add, but I think for me, it's around building a point of view and building a portfolio, building a presence, whether that's on your own blog, your social media, um, getting that picked up. But I think the biggest thing here is just to be open and build a skill set through talking to others, doing your own, taking classes um, through General Assembly, things like that. Um, and then the last thing, which I think Meg does really well, is um, as an independent, cultivate your sources, um, build those relationships with those athletes, and um, that will be key in whatever you do. So, Meg, I'm sure you have other stuff. Yeah, other yeah. Than that. No, I think it's a really good point because I've also had so many of these roles kind of on the way. Like, even when I worked for the league, right, I started as a content producer, which is kind of this, like, catch-all nothing thing of just, like, you know, you're writing, you're kind of doing some other stuff, right? But it's kind of like this made-up thing of just, like, content. And then I had originally applied for the social media manager job at the NWSL. And I walked in and I interviewed who with the guy who eventually created this other position for me. But he was like, oh, you don't really have this experience. And I was like, well, you know, I'm doing freelance for MLS, but also like I'm firmly embedded in this league. And I guarantee you, if you put me on the social channels, like I'm going to know how to speak this language. And then by 11 months later, I want to say I was the social media manager and he was like, okay, you were right. <laughs> so part of it really is just a knowing the culture around the space. Right. But I also think it's, can you, you know, cultivate, can you take photos or can you show that you can do video? Like, unfortunately still the infrastructure in the sport is not super great. So like the fact that I could take photos, do video, do interviews, right, like all of these skills sometimes get mushed into these kind of like terrible roles where you're trying to do 17 things at once. So there is kind of this pressure of like, can you do multiple things, right? Can you, can you like stand out on the field and do fun content from the field while also maybe writing that game recap at the end of the day? So the more that you can kind of like test and, and float your wings out and say like, okay, maybe this is what I'm good at. Maybe I can figure out how to add this to my skill set is great. But on the flip side, like I think it also is really important to talk about the fact that these roles are not necessarily going to be well paying, right? Like there's also just kind of the fundamental pressure of the how to build that skill set within this world right now is not necessarily going to pay you a lot. And so, I mean, I spent personally thousands of dollars traveling to cover games on my own dime before I got a full-time job. And that was part of, you know, that's like the privilege of, okay, I work at a biotech company. And then on top of my normal 40, 50 hours a week there, I'm spending 20 or 30 hours a week writing articles, going to games, and I'm not making any money whatsoever. It is just to build the fact that like, this is what I'm interested in. So there's also that element. And I think as the league grows, as the space grows, we are going to start from some of that. But, you know, there is that kind of pressure of, you know, the internship discussion slash discourse goes up on Twitter like every four or five months now. But how do we make sure that we're mentoring and equipping people who want to get into the space with the skills that they need without saying like, oh, hello, free labor. Thank you. Like that's kind of the bigger challenge as well. That's exciting about women's sports is that it's, there's a, like a lot of free room and to do things differently. Do you guys agree with that in the sense that given the way sports is traditionally covered, do you think that women's sports media coverage should mirror that as well? And 
if no, like it, it should be totally different. Do you think with that mindset, building off of what um, Courtney had asked, can that help start the change in the 4% um, coverage, like the 4% in women's overall in regarding to sports media coverage, only 4% is garnered towards um, women's sports? You go first, because I think we had, you had a good answer in the prep. Yeah, I mean, I just think, so there's two ways of looking at it. And I think Rachel and I are really good examples of the two different directions that you come at this from. Because I specifically, you know, when, when I got this offer from The Athletic, I specifically wanted to go to The Athletic, which is a traditional media space, even though it is a startup, right? It is something different. There is the paywall, like there's all that kind of athletic stuff. But fundamentally, this is a mainstream sports outlet that covers men's sports. And we're starting to try to figure out, okay, how do we cover women's sports in a more meaningful way? And part of that is hiring someone that lives in the space, but also there is value to independent places. Like, you know, obviously I got my start at Equalizer Soccer, just women's sports is super important. Like there is no, we are trying to build something in a system that is built for men's sports. And we have to start figuring out the infrastructure of this space as well. And part of that is, changing the infrastructure of coverage of men's sports to change and actually change that 4% number. But part of it is just building our own space as well. And both like, they're not natural enemies either. They work together because everyone wins when you increase the coverage. Like I don't fundamentally view just women's sports as like competition or anything. Like we need both of these things to succeed in order to change the overall landscape. We are fundamentally working in tandem, in my opinion. I totally agree with Meg, and I think we talked about this previously, but exactly what Meg said in terms of we have to build that infrastructure, we don't have to copy the way they do men's sports, like that is an infrastructure we can look at, but that's just a starting spot. That's something we can take, see what worked, what didn't. But I think a lot of people were saying there's no money to be made in women's sports, but right now we're at a turning point where um, not only is there an audience, but people are that hold the money are recognizing that there is money to be made. So you're seeing this in the NWSL signing major sponsors. You're seeing the WNBA just recently signed with Google and all the momentum. I think what we need to do is just consistent quality coverage and building the store, the stories and around the players. And I think exactly what Meg was saying, we're not competitors, the more, <laughs> the more, the better. And I think if you look at all the major news networks like CBS, ABC, they all exist. They're all covering a lot of, maybe a lot of the same things, but they all differentiate in a way. It's all specialized. There's different ways you can engage with your audience, different tones. So I think exactly what Meg said, it's it's something we need to do and, and, and the more and the better, just because the, the 4% needs to get better. That, like what other, looking at the road ahead for women's soccer coverage and women's sports coverage, what other issues would you like to see changed. Meg, do you want to start? Of what do you in, in terms of like well there's issues along the lines of diversity. Yeah. Oh change, yeah. Yeah. Those lines. Social Yeah. Issues. And I, I definitely think, you know, one of the other strengths here of this kind of traditional versus independent and the way that you can intertwine is that you are getting more diverse voices, especially in the independent, right? Like I think about someone like Courtney Stith and, and Andre Carlisle, who started their own podcast to cover the NWSL. And those are voices that like, yes, I think they're, they're writing stories in certain places, but like, this is just kind of like a perfect medium for their voices to cut through. And so we are, I think, starting to be more cognizant of it. And I think that there is still so much work to be done on that front, especially with, I mean, women's soccer is just like an overwhelmingly white world because it has been built for middle or upper class white women. Like that is just kind of, and it is also still overall just kind of across the landscape, like whether it's like ownership of pro teams or, you know, the youth, like the people in power are white men generally. So there's still kind of that overwhelming work that needs to be done. But I do think that in terms of, you know, I think about the people that I probably talk with the most and like someone like Sandra Herrera or Steph Young that was on Randy's Corner last weekend, like 
those are voices now that have risen. I mean, Sandra Herrera really does have the potential to be one of the major faces of the NWSL, thanks to her work in CBS and being on pregame and postgame and in their Champions League coverage. Like it's even just bigger than NWSL. And I think having those voices raised and celebrated is super, super important. And I, I think that we are at least starting to see that shift, but like I, I cannot like overstate how much more work still needs to be done. But I think that there are a lot of people actively trying to think like, how, okay, how do we make that change? How do we get more voices into the mix? And part of that is just also, you know, when people are trying to pitch stories freelance, like if you want to get a story into the New York Times about NWSL, first of all, is that story even getting greenlit? But who's pitching it and who are they approving? And it's that kind of infrastructure stuff, again, that needs to happen that is going to be a very long journey probably. Yeah, I don't have much to add, and I totally agree with Meg, and I think it's exactly what she was saying. It's the, for the decision, decision makers in, those, in the infrastructure. How do we keep continue to chip away at, at making progress there? And I think the biggest thing is, like Mike said, NWSL is huge WNBA, but how do we elevate the other women's sports as well? Um, how do we bring them up with us? And obviously, we need to start somewhere, but I think that will be important in infrastructure getting just the word out and being able to just know and educate others is going to be super important. Well, a question from the q and I believe Becky asked the question of, Meg, you mentioned your wife getting some time with you amidst the work schedule. What is it, what is it like for your personal lives being in an industry that can require much of your time and often haphazardly? This is a great question. Um, I think fortunately my wife did kind of know what she was getting into a little bit because she has just really experienced it from the beginning. But yeah, I mean, honestly, it is tough. And I think, you know, France was something where we really did work and say like, okay, if you came up to the part of the tournament that's in Lyon, like I'm going to have this Airbnb, you can go. She has a friend that was in France. So she went out to visit her for a couple of days, but like she was able to come to the world cup final. Like I fortunately, God bless, there were a couple of Portland fans that had an extra ticket and I was able to snag her one. And it, it was a moment that we don't get a huge amount of, but I think that, you know, there have certainly been nights, I mean, for all the equal pay coverage, it was just like every Friday night, there would be 1,000, 2,000 pages of law documents coming out and I would have already eaten dinner and then I would get the email and I would just go, okay, I'll see you at 3 a.m., right? Like. <laughs> So there is some patience, but also part of it too is really trying to make as many boundaries as possible that like if I am doing something, the phone is flipped over, right? Um, and I'm not always, like, I'm not always great. I don't want to say I'm great at this. I, this is the attempt. Um, but also just, you know, saying like tomorrow I had a choice between a work meeting or uh, a ceremony for she got her PhD last year. And I said, okay, I'm going to go to that right? Like there is, you have to kind of carve some of this time out. And fortunately, I think that there is very much an understanding of, you know, she's a, she's a professor now, like both of our schedules can be weird. And some of it is just like, I can take this Tuesday off. Let's go somewhere. Like, let's go hike. And we will both turn our phones off and it will be amazing. And I think that's really the, the challenge is like, I don't really get weekends. As soon as the season starts, like my weekends are gone. And part of the window is also just like, can we go to the farmer's market together on Saturday morning? That's a safe time for both of us. We're going to take that time and make sure it happens every single week. So it is just kind of finding those pockets, but also being aware that sometimes things are just going to happen and they just happen. I think exactly what Meg said in terms of setting boundaries and that also just communicating that with your team because actually goes back to the team of like, this is going to avoid burnout for Meg to go spend five hours going through those law documents. Like you want her to be doing that and that th giving her the space on whatever day is going to actually create that. So being clear with your team, it starts at the top. If you are managing someone, that's going to be important. Um, but I think it ultimately will help the team and the rest of the coverage if you do allow that. Um, but it's all about setting boundaries and being okay with walking exactly what Meg said, walking away from the laptop and phone, which I know is really, really hard. 
another question. This is a great question from the Q&A. Lynn Puma asks, as fans, how can we advocate for more coverage? Rachel, do you want to start with that one? I think the biggest thing is, and this is with the athletic, we don't have a, a paywall, but like one of those is like, yes, please, please read, please share, please advocate for these publications that are focused on women's sports. And um, I think the biggest thing there is just being able to spread the word and actually put, <laughs> put the money where, where it needs to be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously there is a paywall. I mean, frequently, like right at the moment, the athletic is a dollar a month to subscribe, right? Like, so there are chances to especially do it at, you know, sale points, right? Um, but the athletic is a platform that is basically built on metrics, right? So like people are looking and saying like, oh, women's soccer is getting this number of subscribers. Interesting. Does it need more? And those conversations are happening and they only happen when people subscribe. <laughs> like you can actually directly force some companies to adjust because if they're thinking, oh, no one's interested in women's sports, right? And then all of a sudden you have 5,000 people subscribing because of women's soccer, that changes the conversation. And it also changes the conversation I can have behind the scenes of saying like, wow, look at this demand. I am one human that likes to sleep. <laughs> you know what would help? More people. <laughs> so there is a real way to impact that and to, and to, you know, if you do subscribe to a place like The Athletic or Equalizer Soccer, or if you subscribe to the Just Women Sports newsletter, like also communicating that, sharing that, all like you can truly, like, I, I don't know if people quite understand the power that they have to actually kind of change the trajectory of some of this coverage directly, especially from like newer media properties like The Athletic, because they're going to respond to where the money is. And it's that simple. One question, what do you think it will take um... I guess quickly, um, what do you think it will take for media personnel to get paid more? That's an in-depth question, but if we can answer it in less than 60 seconds. Meg, do you want to start? It's just changing decision makers. Like that's, that's really what it is, is showing that there's a demand for coverage and that my work is just as valued or Rachel and Just Women Sports is just as valued as like Waj at ESPN, right? Do I do the same fundamental job as someone like him in breaking news and all like, then yes, it should have the same value. So like, I think showing decision makers that there is value in this work is always the end, end answer here. Rachel set for that. Another Rachel here. I'm set with that. We can leave the mic drop on Meg. Horizon, Meg, Rachel, thank you so much. We are so honored to have you all come here and give us all this incredible knowledge. I mean, like every panel when they end, but burnout and being able to set your boundaries, subscribing, the simple things, they go a long way from communication, be it to those that you're working directly with, to communicating with the other folks in your community to open their eyes about access and who's actually getting the time to do that extra gig to that point, Meg. I mean, it roots right back to inclusivity um, and then supports also the mental health awareness month that we are in by accident, but we're always staying on theme. It's true to the media and journalistic style. Uh, we can't thank Just Women Sports enough. We love what they're doing. The Athletic keep pushing more women to write more on this topic. It's really worth it. Thank you all for your time. I'll invite you to close off your cameras and I will bring up uh, our next segment. Really excited for this. This is all about inclusive interviewing and how to check your bias when interviewing. It's often something we don't always think of. I think more and more we're trying to do a better job, but what are those tips? What are those things? So for hiring folks, for folks that are going into uh, interviews. You can get some insight from this as well. Are companies leading with some of these questions? Are these things at the top of their list? 
does that give you insight into what that company stands for and how much they live by their values? So whether you're applying or whether you're doing the hiring, this will be really valuable for you. All right, everyone, Aries Pickett from the NWSL Senior Talent and Acquisition and Administrative Manager. Dive in, Aries. I give you the floor. Hi, everyone. I am so ecstatic and I'm so happy to have this opportunity to speak with you on this afternoon. I am going to give you some little nuggets um, where they're actually nice big nuggets that I hope that you can take away from and it can help you in your professional career. I am going to talk about how to check your biases. And I'm gonna dive into just the bi biases in general, um, but also get into how to check your biases from an interview standpoint, because I am in HR for the National Women's Soccer League. Okay, so let's dive into it because I wanna give you guys an opportunity to ask any questions you want, okay? All right, so let's start with bias, right? What is a bias, right? So a bias is simply a preference or or against something, right? So it's important to note that there's nothing wrong with having biases. I mean, we all have biases, right? It's, it's something natural that we, we, we have. There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem occurs when we allow our biases to create an unfair advantage or a disadvantage in the workplace environment. That's the problem. So, for example, I'm from Chicago, right? And depending on what side of Chicago you live on, you either can be a White Sox fan or a Cubs fan. So let's just say if I have two candidates and I cl clearly know um, that one is a Sox fan and one is a Cubs fan. Now, if I'm gravitating purposely, intentionally to the Sox fan over the Cubs fan, that person has a disadvantage because I can relate to them. I'm giving, I'm showing them favor. And so I'm being biased towards them, right? And that's something that we truly want to avoid, right? Because to that other candidate, that's me showing them an unfair uh, disadvantage. So because biases can influence our workplace decisions and interactions, it is so crucial that we change our behavioral patterns, right? And get rid of those old habits that has been inherently embedded in us, because we have them. Um, and when we commit, uh, to work against uh, those uh, biases, those biased behaviors, behaviors, we can then start seeing a positive change uh, that can help create a more diverse and inclusive environment, right? But we have to, we have to start with ourselves, we have to push for that change. So how do we work against those biased behaviors? Um, this is the most simplest answer that I can give, and it's one to be aware of its presence, right? Unfortunately, there are a lot of people that are in the leadership space that are unconsciously biased, right? They're not even aware that they have these biases, right? It's, you know, but it's important that, especially leaders and HR professionals, it's so important that we, it's called like when we see it and we are informed of it, that it's called out and is checked, right? And once called out and is checked and we inform, um, you know, leaders, employees, whomever they are, um, again, we have to make them aware so that it can bring a, a certain amount of self-awareness to them. Um, to, for them, they need to be able to acknowledge and recognize how their bias is created an unfair advantage or disadvantage. And then the most important thing is showing action behind it, right? So we need to make sure that that change is, is, is happening in some way, shape or form. And uh, we see differently in their decision-making within the workplace. And, you know, to be honest, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. It's something that, you know, it's, you have to keep, you know, pushing towards and keep, sometimes you have to keep on informing, you know, your management team, your leadership team uh, about it. But a move towards change is a move in the right direction. So, you know, just keep on, you know, definitely pushing towards that change. I think as HR professionals, it is so important that we check our biases at the door because we have a significant impact um, within the workplace. Like we are the people that 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 literally will impact who gets recruited 
who gets hired and even who gets promoted, right? So it starts with us. We have to make sure that we make sure that we are, are, that's checked on our end first and foremost, because we're shaping the workplace environment. And we also have a sense of responsibility to inform and even to an extent educate, right? Educate those who are in these leadership positions about, about their biased behaviors, right? Some will be receptive, some will not, but you still have to do your part in doing what needs to be done to, to, to create this positive change uh, towards, you know, just, you know, biased behavior being just like, like a no-no, right? And, you know, for example, you know, for me, like I'm always recruiting um, when I recruit and then when I interview candidates. So I have to work collaborative, I have to be collaborative in my work with other hiring managers. So even though as an HR professional, I can check, I know that, okay, it's programmed in me to check my bias at the door. But again, it's also important for me to have those separate conversations and bring the hiring managers in so that they know, right? Hey, you know, when these when these candidates are coming in, you know, you, you need to check this and check that and make sure that, you know, it's a, a fair playing field for, for everyone, right? Um, Otherwise, they can be un unconsciously biased, right? So it's important to also just, you know, have those conversations, especially when you when you're collaborating and when you're working with other hiring managers, right? That's that's very important. Another thing, um, because I've been in HR for about 15 years now, so I am dating myself. Um, I, like I said, I'm programmed to check my biases. It's, 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 it's natural for me, but I also realize that for some people, it takes, it can take an, an, an extra effort, but that's okay. Again, any change is a change in the right direction. So when you are informed, it's important that you do your due diligence and, and just try to put it forth an effort to change, you know, that behavior in, in, in that the way of thinking, right? Um, so let's get into how we can check our bias when it comes to interviewing. I have some examples that I really want to give you guys. These are real life examples um, in my career. Um, so early on in my career, uh, I want to talk about a bias that I had, right? And I had to, it was a te teachable moment for me because I had to learn from it. Um, I was interviewing for a creative position. This is like, I guess on the same level as someone who works in the graphics department, right? And so I had two, two perfectly qualified candidates that, you know, was knocking the phone interviews out of the park. So we called both candidates, one male, one female, we called them in for an interview. Um, and so the first interview was the, um, the female who came in. And let me just scale back for a little bit. Early on in my career, I was taught to, you know, that professional, like candidates, when you bring them in, they have to be professional on all levels. They even have to appear uh, professional. So they have to look the part, not only have the qualifications, but they also have to look the part. So that bias was already embedded in me on like, okay, I need to pay attention to what these candidates look like, because that's going to shape my decision on, on whether or not we should hire them. So going back to the story, the female came in and she looked apart. Again, she was qualified. She did great on the interview, dressed professionally, everything. So I'm like, okay, good job. You know, so I'm like, all right, well, depending on the next candidate, that's going to determine my decision. So the next candidate came in, he was a guy and he literally had a mohawk. He had tattoos up to here. He dressed professionally though. So it wasn't nothing that he, as far as like, you know, he, he him coming in with jeans, t-shirts. No, he actually dressed professionally. However, again, he had the hair, he had these big, huge earrings. And so before I even called him into the room, I had already passed judgment in a sense of like, all right, yeah, uh, I already know I'm hiring this um, candidate A because he's coming in here like he's on a biker club. That was me being very biased already towards the, the first candidate. And I hadn't even interviewed with him. So I call this a candidate into the room and we start interviewing. But I tell you, this candidate literally blew, blew me away. He was a creative genius. He was articulate. And when I tell you, he he really was the perfect person for the job. And on the inside, I was just feeling so bad because I'm like, here it is before I even sit down and interview 
with this candidate. I'm passing judgment because I see tattoos and earrings and uh, wild hair. And that would have been the biggest mistake that I would have made because, you know, me being biased. So at the end of the day, we I end up making an offer to the most qualified candidate, which was my, I called him my, my little rocker. And he did a phenomenal job with, with his just intelligence. Again, he was a creative genius. And again, that was a teachable moment for me. We cannot um, we cannot make the assumptions based on what someone looks like. We can't pass judgment based on what someone looks looks like, um, because you know also that can open up the door to discrimination. So, and that's something that we clearly want to avoid. We can't pass judgment because in our minds we have this idea of what a professional should should look like. And he was very professional, very very articulate. And he was, a, again, a creative genius. So again, that was something that I learned early on in my career. Um, and I think just to even throw salt on me, like literally after that, like as I started interviewing, like um, for, for the graphics and creative departments, they were all, they you know, because they're wired differently, right? So they're always like, you know, creative with their looks and stuff like that. And I was just like, hey, I'm welcome in it. You know, I don't judge people how they, you know, on how they look. I judge based on um, the job description, your qualifications, because that is what's important. And I also ask the question, okay, ask the question, will this person and be successful in the role that we're trying to hire and hire for. And I think when we get caught up on what someone looks like, whether it's their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, we can truly miss the mark. So my advice, take the blinders off, focus on what's important. And that's if the, the, the candidate is qualified for the position and will they be successful? Right. That is the most important thing that we should focus on as um, HR professionals, as hiring managers. That is so important. Another thing I wanted to um, talk about that's also it was a teachable moment for me before I open it up to the Q&A so we won't run out of time is how when you recruit and when you interview, um, it's typical to be biased when it comes to names, right? So when you're recruiting, um, you can literally assume a person is of a certain ethnic group or a certain background because of their name, because of where they live, because of where, well, yeah, where they live, and you know even gender, right? Because you have unisex names, right? So you can't do that either. Um, one example that I would like to share with you guys on today is um, at my previous company, um, wasn't diverse at all. And we knew that we needed to make an extra effort to, we had a position that was open and was like, okay, we need to make an extra effort to get a minority for this particular role. We really needed that. So um, when we recruited, you know, uh, for the position, we came across a candidate and this is not a real name because I want to just, just, I'm just giving you a filler name. So, um, but we, we, we came across a candidate that was well qualified. So for the sake of this conversation, I'll say her name was Rebecca Garcia. So had not seen who this person looked, you know, what this person looked like, but we assumed that, okay, well, we were checking a box because Rebecca had the last name of Garcia and she was qualified like she literally checked all of our boxes and on her resume it said that she was fluent in spanish so right there it's like okay well we know she's hispanic she's a minority let's bring her in we want her so again we made sure she was qualified because i mean you can't just hire a minority just because just to meet a box you should you should hire someone who was qualified first and foremost, and then you go to the, the specifics later. So anyway, she was qualified. And then again, from our perspective, she was, she checked the box off of being minority, a minority. So she came into the interview. When she walked in, she happened to be Caucasian who was married to Hispanic. So um, we were just like, oh crap, like, oh, you know, we're thinking like, shoot, we thought she was a minority. Um, however, we proceeded with the interview. Again, she literally was amazing. She was not only qualified, but she had the personality. She was well-rounded and she was literally the best person for the job. Now, as HR professionals, we could have been biased and say, hey, you know, although she's qualified, 
she's really not what we're looking for. We really wanted to hire a minority. We really need to hire a minority. Um, so we could have passed up on her. However, in that case, I believe we did the right thing because we would have showed by we would have been biased to her had we not hired her. Why? Because she was qualified. And that's really what we really want. Yes, we want to make sure that we have an all-inclusive and a diverse environment, but we at the core, can a person do a job, right? <laughs> We have a business to run, so we have to make sure that a person is qualified, if anything. And this, and and and, and you know, Rebecca Garcia was was qualified. She literally was the perfect perfect person for the job, and I'm so happy that we proceeded with hiring her, um, whether she was a minor or not. My point is, you can't be biased in any situation, right? It has to be checked at the door. And when you when you assume you form all of these other generalizations about a person and it's just it's it can set you up. Right. Because you, you can't. So, you know, again, when you're hiring and you're interviewing, um, recruiting, you have to check your bias at the door. That is so important. And that's going to help, again, you shape a, a, a diverse and inclusive environment that when you, you know, when you're able to say, hey, you know, I know I need to not look at this person for this or that, but able to really reflect, you know, because some people, again, they don't like to admit that they have certain biases, but when we're able to recognize and we're, we're aware of them and check them, you can literally help improve, you know, your, your work environment, right? Because you're bringing in people of, you know, not, you know, judging them, you're bringing in people, you know, because of who they are and, you know, their experience and their background, doesn't matter what they look like, where they come from, where they live, it's all fair and it's all equal. So I just wanted to wrap that up and I would like to open it up for any questions and um, anything This is open. Yes, Aries, I wanted to let you know, we have about two minutes, so definitely some time to get to a couple questions. If you would go over to the Q&A, um, we have one from Horizon that I think folks would find it really interesting to get your feedback on. Um, but then some of the other questions we'll have to follow up offline just because we have some more experts waiting to come in. Okay, from Horizon, do NWSL players undergo bias training? Yeah, so um, it, it depends on, to be honest, it depends on the, the club level. I know some clubs have um, had training, um, but I can't say all of them. It depends on the club level. But I know at the league level, we literally have been working behind the scenes to make available training and education for just not the league office, but to extend it to all of our clubs just so that we can make sure that everyone has the proper training training, uh, whether it's diversity, inclusion, harassment, bias, whatever. We just want to make sure that that we're providing everyone the education that they need to, to create a positive, diverse, and inclusive environment. So that's something that we are working towards. Wonderful. I think you answered that in such a concise way. Maybe we can do one more additional question. Um, what do you, what is the best way to find internal jobs? Well, I don't know I don't know internal jobs, what that might mean. Um, any tips on negotiation ba beyond the base compensation? So any tips on negotiating salary? Just negotiating salary? Um, well, you know, like let's just say if you're if, if you only have a budget for a, a salary um, and you can't go up or down or what, what or I'm sorry, up. What I would do is I'll look at the benefit uh, package as, as, as a whole. So like, you know, if if you're stuck on that budget and you can't increase it, look at offering the candidate um, an additional week of vacation or just look how other ways, you know, that you can offer that candidate something in exchange for increasing that salary, which you don't have the budget for. So there's other ways you can negotiate um, salary without bumping that salary up just by the benefits, benefit packages. It's a full package. Aries, thank you so much for giving us some of your time. We are going to have to hear you come back for more one day soon. Sure. Thank you for so listening. Take care, guys. Bye. Thanks so much, Aries. Yeah, you could pop off that camera. We appreciate you being here. All right, folks, this is the last formal breakout session. We will then have open networking 
uh, opening up at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, and everything else in between and around. Uh, you'll want to get to the professional playing table, hang out with Sam Johnson, mentorship table. You'll have Tiffany from Street Soccer USA. And Clets has an entrepreneur table, media and journalism, which we just heard from her friends. We have Stephanie Young uh, joining us there. Meg Sullivan from the NWSL is her last segment. So if you have any more questions around finance, jump into the finance table on floor one. Um, as you're, you, we are, we are wrapping up. So you have 10 minutes for this, uh, for this breakout session. We went a little bit over and then get start making your way to part four via those banners. I will send you a note, but nevertheless, uh, go, go check out and hang out with some folks and we'll be in touch soon.